Discord now. Great. Okay. All right, so just to get us started, um, I'm going to start with a territorial acknowledgement. I am here today on the um, traditional and unceded territories of the, of the Lekwungen and Wissanich peoples, um, in which what is um, colonially referred to as Victoria, BC. Um, and just want to honor and respect um, those lands today. If you would like to put in your own ter territorial acknowledgement in the chat box, that's um, welcome as well. And to introduce myself and our guest today, uh, my name is Megan Brown. I am the secretary on the board of the Harm Reduction Nurses Association. Um, joined the board about a year ago now, just under a year. Um, I am a settler of um, European Caucasian descent. I use the pronoun she, her. Um, I mainly practice and study in the background of alcohol harm reduction. Um, I work as a research coordinator and doctoral fellow on the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program study, and I've been working on this project for about the past six years. Um, and have worked as an NRN in um, a residential map back in Ontario and um, a map and outreach based map here in um, BC during COVID-19. And so Bernie, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself as well. Everybody, um, I'm Bernie Pauly. Um, I'm a professor in the School of Nursing and a scientist at the Canadian Institute uh, for Substance Use Research. And I would just locate myself as an uninvited settler as well on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen people. Um, and I think I just wanna also acknowledge that um, the research we're gonna share is uh, been produced by the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program Study, which I've been a co-lead of since the beginning, and Megan um, is part of that team as well. Next slide, I think. Um, we've started the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program study a number of years ago, and uh, we've been very fortunate over the last little more than almost a decade uh, to have received funding for the research through a variety of sources, including um, the ones that you see on, there on the screen. Next, ah, there we go. Okay. Um, this is going to be fairly familiar um, to you, but you know, in the kind of alcohol harm reduction world, um, we think about three kinds of harms, acute harms, chronic harms, and social harms. And uh, one of the reasons that I share this is because when we're looking at managed alcohol programs, we're looking at how can we reduce this set of harms? That's kind of the indicator or the bar, if you like, uh, for success of, of managed alcohol programs. Um, they're a harm reduction program as opposed to uh, an abstinence-based program. Next slide. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that there are a lot of broader contexts that produce substance use um, harms. And, you know, we can uh, think of things like uh, poverty, uh, unstable or housing or homelessness, um, criminalization um, produces further harms of, of substance use, um, a long history of, of ongoing colonization, um, and the mechanisms through which some of those work are, you know, producing trauma, loss, uh, grief, which then in that sense, substance use becomes a, a way of coping um, with those very difficult uh, kinds of life situations. Next slide. Um, some ways that um, we respond uh, to reduce the harms of, of alcohol, um, and this comes from work that our colleague, uh, Dr. Tim Stockwell, who also co-leads the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program study with me, um, have 
respond to broader harms of alcohol in, in policy. And this is specifically around kind of one aspect of policy, alcohol uh, policy is in terms of pricing. So one example of that is, you know, setting kind of a, what we, what they call a sweet spot in pricing. So the, it's priced not so high that people are being, you know, forced into um, other sources of, of alcohol and it's not priced too low, um, which would be one example of kind of uh, types of pricing. The physical availability uh, of alcohol has an impact on alcohol harm. So for example, the number of uh, outlets there are, um, the hours which those outlets are open. Um, you can think about things like off sales uh, when they're available, um, those all have to do with the physical availability that has been associated with, with harms of uh, alcohol. Drinking and driving is uh, another obvious one um, in terms of, uh, you know, setting uh, safe limits around alcohol consumption and not drinking and driving. Um, along the bottom, these are sort of in terms of a bit of a hierarchy in terms of population impact is marketing and advertising. There are restrictions on how alcohol can be marketed and advertised because that's been associated um, with reducing harms. Minimum legal drinking age, um, screening and brief intervention, which is a, a primary care strategy that probably many people um, are involved in, and then server uh, training and management can also be um, a harm reduction strategy. Sometimes people uh, sort of raise this concern that, um, you know, those strategies focus on the consumption of alcohol. That's true because there is a relationship, obviously, between um, consumptions and harm harms, but it's not saying you know, it's not restricting or saying no drinking or abstinence as a goal. So we still call it alcohol harm reduction. One area that there's been a gap of alcohol harm reduction interventions um, have been for, you know, situations um, in which people, uh, if, they, if they're homeless, being forced, um, you know, to drink outside, being at high risk of assault, violence, injury, other harms, exposure uh, to weather, um, and in some cases, death, um, unsafe patterns of drinking, um, when people are um, not able to um, afford alcohol, sometimes there can be this pattern of binge drinking and withdrawal and seizures, which can be obviously quite harmful. And then in uh, some cases, uh, drinking unsafe sources of, of alcohol, which would be non-beverage, um, use and then um, also sometimes that's criminalized and stigmatized. So we, you know, we've referred to this as um, illicit drinking. And we have a lack of uh, alcohol harm reductions to address um, some of these issues. Next slide. Um, Managed alcohol programs actually started in the late 90s. Um, one of the first ones was uh, Seton House um, in Toronto. Seton House is a very large um, shelter, and they recognized that um, there were people in Toronto who were staying outside in the freezing cold and were not able uh, to uh, get access to shelter because they were not um, able to come inside with their alcohol. And there was actually a coroner's inquest um, into two freezing deaths that actually resulted in uh, the start of the managed alcohol program at Seton House, where first they were storing the alcohol uh, for people coming into the shelter and then recognizing that they could provide, you know, a safe source of alcohol that would allow people um, to to manage um, withdrawal and other, other harms. Um, the Poor is a documentary done uh, by the Fifth Estate. It's um, on the Ottawa Managed Alcohol Program. You can find it on YouTube. Um, it gives a kind of a good insight into kind of a day-to-day -day, um, what a map looks like in Ottawa. Ottawa was one of the early maps um, as well. Um, and this story by The Guardian, uh, the shelter that gives wine to alcoholics actually is a great description 
of the Ottawa program with this, with the very unfortunate and, and I would say stigmatizing title um, in terms of sort of, you know, putting a very controversial uh, kind of title on this, but it's it's also a good description of the Ottawa program. And um, it was done a couple of years ago. So the evidence um, that's cited in there, you're gonna get a better picture of that, that today. Uh, this shows um, where the, some of the managed alcohol programs are in Canada. They're spread across, you can see they're spread all across the country. I'm not aware of any um, in the Maritimes, but I could be wrong. Um, I've given a lot of presentations um, across the country and often someone says to me, um, oh, we do a managed alcohol because a lot of times managed alcohol programs kind of operate um, under the radar. Yeah, thanks, Harold. Um, there's one in Halifax. We need to add you need, uh, we're going to put you in touch if you don't mind us getting in touch with you um, to add this to the map because we can, we continually are tracking um, where managed alcohol programs are. Um, and uh, kudos to the people in Nova Scotia because I uh, knew some of the individuals um, that were there that were really working hard to make a program happen. Um, and so we have at this point probably about 33, I think there's probably more than that um, because we always are hearing about new programs um, with about 10 of those coming online during COVID. Next um, slide. So the purpose of um, the CMAPS um, research is to rigorously evaluate maps in Canada and generate insights into the implementation and outcomes. And here's our main question. Do maps reduce consumption, alcohol-related harms, improve housing tenure, health and quality of life, and reduce economic costs? And if they do that, how do they do that? Um, and I just want to share that I didn't particularly, as a nurse researcher, go out and say, I'm going to, you know, do a program of research around managed alcohol. Um, it really started with um, a program in Vancouver that was being developed by Port Portland Hotel Society who um, contacted myself and contacted uh, Tim Stockwell, who's also at CSER and said, you know, we're gonna start this program because we have some people who we really wanna provide housing for and have been challenged um, to do that. And we think that a managed alcohol program would really help them. And so would you work with us um, to evaluate it? And we did a very, very small um, pilot, which then we um, expanded into a full scale um, research study after that. So the CMAPS really has provided evaluation and research support to managed alcohol programs that are up until now been largely run um, by nonprofits. So we don't have any involvement in the, in the delivery of maps, but we've had a lot of involvement in the planning, um, evaluation, and then informing um, how those maps sometimes um, develop over time. Next slide. Um, to my knowledge, Amanda, there are no maps on a reserve. Um, I believe that there has been some interest um, in them. There are, and Megan's going to talk about this at the end, there are several Indigenous run maps, um, and we've worked with um, a few of them. Um, Megan, I think I'm turning it over to you on this one. Is that correct, or do you want me to do this one? Yeah, you can turn it over to me. Um, apologies, my keyboard is sticky. It's and it either doesn't move or it jumps far ahead. So apologies, everyone, for the rapid, rapid movement. Um, thank you, Bernie. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of map because sometimes when we talk a lot about the research, the actual practical pieces can get lost. So we always try to um, blend our kind of experiences um, in what Bernie was talking about in. Um, policy development and, and uh, practice as well as in research. So this slide has actually changed a little bit over time as we learned more about maps. So in the past, when we first started working with maps, we really knew about the like more shelter-based and um, housing permanent or uh, transitional 
residential programs, um, but we've seen over the past, um, I guess, since this has start, since this project has started in the past nine, nine to 10 years, and particularly over COVID, um, many different types of map settings um, pop up and evolve. So more so these um, three pillars that you see on your right side um, are kind of the consistent things that we see across map, but just in different um, kind of combinations, but the settings in which they occur can really vary. So we um, do have maps that are just day programs. We have permanent um, programs in which maps are embedded within residential or housing sites. We have maps in transitional housing sites, maps in shelters, emergency shelters, and um, more recently, out, um, outreach-based maps. Maps combine some, um, some combination of social, recreational, and cultural support. So that might include um, anywhere from, you know, groups, um, social services connections, um, recreational opportunities, um, supports for um, in some Indigenous people in maps, such as connection to one-to-one -one elder support or um, ceremonial supports and often um, supports for connection to family and community. The actual map piece is um, really just one piece of programming as well um, and really varies across the spectrum of need in terms of the um, the profile of kind of people who are in um, in the program or in the house or in the drop in or on the caseload. So traditionally, um, a lot of people would think, you know, map is what we see in the media, like what was displayed on the documentary. Bernie was talking about the poor, where you know, map is administered by staff on an hourly basis. Um, that's really, I think, kind of evolved over time. So whereas some people might really benefit from that alcohol care plan, we're seeing different types of kind of alcohol harm reduction approaches um, develop in MAP, in MAP over time. For example, um, in outreach-based programs, delivery might occur just once or twice a day um, with check-ins and then Across different sites, you'll see um, every person who's um, facilitating, you know, connection to the alcohol supply is trained in kind of, you know, assessing for um, signs of intoxic intoxication and withdrawal and um, following up from there. And then health and social services, again, are um, a big part of MAPS. So often many MAPS are either have a primary care team or nursing embedded in the map or have a connection, like a strong connection to a service where they might not be employed by the map, but they're there to um, support people as needed as they um, experience health changes. And I already talked about this in our previous slide, but um, as you can see that middle kind of row or, or column there is what we um, most commonly have heard of in terms of maps, in, term of, in, in terms of our early research and in terms of what's been in the media and what's been really publicized are residential and shelter-based maps in which alcohol is administered um, mostly during the day. Um, and then um, drop-in based maps and peer-led maps have also been um, around for quite a while as well too. So there is the Drinker's Lounge in um, the downtown east side, which is fairly well known, um, which might have folks there who, you know, might not need that type of, or, or want that type of, you know, really intensive alcohol um, administration administration schedule, but maybe um, just are looking for a safe place to drink or are looking for, um, you know, cheaper um, drinks or are looking to potentially like replace um, unsafe forms of, of alcohol, such as non-beverage alcohol, 
mouthwash with um, safer forms of beverage alcohol, which that program had at one point. Um, it was a program where you could trade in non-beverage alcohol for things like wine and sherry and where people could access a um, brew-based alcohol as well, where peers in the program would often um, um, be employed there to be in charge of brewing the actual supply. And then people could access their um, supply throughout the month in a more consistent way that so that they weren't going through significant periods of binge and withdrawal throughout the month. Um, and then I talked a bit about how outreach-based maps developed a bit more over COVID. We have seen more clinician-based outreach maps, particularly in BC. And we've also seen some peer-led outreach maps too. And we'll talk a little bit about those later. And um, hospital-based maps in acute care that have um, really focused on like facilitating safer and more comfortable um, hospital stays for people in, recognizing, you know, that not everyone wants to necessarily go through withdrawal management if they are um, receiving treatment for an acute healthcare condition. Um, those have existed in a couple sites across Canada, but for pre-COVID, but we're starting to see more of those um, acute care type protocols or programs um, popping up as well. So with our research, um, we as Bernie said, we look at um, implementation and outcomes. So um, in terms of outcomes, there's two types of, or there's really four types of data that we've looked at. So quantitative surveys with um, participants in maps across five to six sites, as well as um, controls. So people who are meeting criteria for map, but are often continuing to experience homelessness. Um, qualitative interviews with participants and staff. Um, we've also looked at things like hospital admissions. Um, for some sites, we've looked at like police contacts, um, but not all sites. And we also looked at policies and protocols. I'm going to talk a little bit about implementation. So in terms of what are the key learnings of what does MAP process and implementation actually look like? What are, the what are the facilitators and barriers to implementing a successful map from the perspective of participants in programs and staff? Um, and then Bernie's going to talk a little bit more about uh, specific outcomes. So obviously, you know, with map, as many of us know, um, even though we, most of us work in harm reduction, um, you know, our system is still very abstinence-based, particularly when it comes for alcohol. Um, you know, we have AA, quite popular, CWA protocol, quite popular in terms of, um, you know, what most healthcare practitioners know, right? So MAP obviously, you know, fills a gap in, has, fills a major gap in most communities where other options weren't available for people. So in this quote, um, this is one of the first pilot studies that were done. Um, one of the participants in the, in the map kind of talks about the cultural difference that they experience in terms of um, not feeling judged in, in um, map and feeling like they um, were trusted by staff in, in comparison to their um, previous experience within abstinence-based programs. So that was, you know, part of our pilot studies is we were seeing, you know, basic um, benefits from MAP in, um, in terms of people feeling safer, people feeling like they could trust the program more, people, people feeling like their quality of life was better. But when we looked across five or six different maps in terms of, you know, what are the consistent kind of um, processes that people are experiencing when they're transitioning from pre-map to post-map. We did this type of um, analysis called situational analysis where we kind of looked at, you know, what are the relationships that people are describing in terms of their interactions within a system um, across different sectors. So I'll kind of show you what I mean here. Um, 
And it looks really complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. <laughs> so um, what people tell us here is um, what, what we heard. So we spoke to close to, I believe it was uh, 60 MAP participants, so 53 and four previous across five sites, te technically six. And so what people told us is that before they came into MAP, they were cycling through all these different settings or arenas as we called them. So they're often talking about, you know, frequently um, experiencing displacement in healthcare settings, in criminal justice, in shelter, in their community and, and, and within the street. Um, there was a lot of precarity in terms of their needs not being met, their personal belongings um, being lost or stolen in terms of being, you know, moved along by police or bylaw or things like that. And they were interacting with all of these different services, but not really having their needs met in any meaningful way. And during all of this, you know, trying to develop survival strategies in terms of alcohol harm reduction, wherein alcohol is not affordable for people, or, you know, alcohol is being um, confiscated by police or, or things like that, where people have to um, develop survival coping strategies such as theft, right? Where to mitigate the real harms, for example, of preventing a seizure and alcohol withdrawal. So people talked about this, th this experience really in terms of criminalization, displacement, survival, and disconnection, um, despite you know, really interacting with a lot of different um, services, again, um, continuing to experience a lot of harms. MAP, when it's introduced within the system, as we say it is kind of um, what, in terms of how people described their experiences, they talk about, um, you know, no longer being um, displaced, you know, because they're in housing, but this, you know, trend, this, um, this, I would say also overlaps within um, day programs as well, in terms of having a safe space to even drink during the day, and then experiencing harm reduction just from having a stable um, alcohol supply in terms of, you know, not having to do things like those um, survival strategies that we talked about, which in turn increase feelings of safety and security. Um, but then also through, you know, the other supports in the map that we were talking about those other pillars, you know, developing enhanced connection to themselves as well as their um, community within the map and their community outside the map. So community within the map being really, really, really important. So developing from what we've heard from some sites, you know, the, a sense of family, a sense of brotherhood. We've heard all of those words, um, but also in reconnecting to their communities that they may have been, you know, lost connection to or to their families, to their children. So these were the types of experiences that we were hearing about. And so in part of this, you know, I'm talking about all of the complex ways in which people um, experience MAPS beyond just like, this is just an alcohol supply that I'm getting that helps to prevent withdrawal. It's much more than that. And, you know, what goes into a MAP is, is in terms of mitigating harms is much more than just the MAP itself. So um, when we looked across these six programs, we also, this is unpublished, but we have these ideas in terms of, um, these are the four key elements that we, we really look to in terms of if a map is being designed, these are the, the, the key things that need to be considered that should be tailored to the type of community and individual that is being supported. So, so making sure that the, um, the support in the map match the actual needs for people. So that might look different for someone, for example, with like, um, you know, chronic severe alcohol use um, with like, uh, like a loss of complex physical harm, such as Wernicke Korsakoff. So in that case, for example, it might look like more nursing supports, whereas for someone who is maybe just um, a younger person who's experiencing lots of binge, binge related harms, for example, might not that might not need or might not want that level of clinical support or in, intensity. And then so alongside that as well, in terms of considering what are the alcohol administration policies 
and dosing approaches for different types of people. Um, connection to some type of housing, no matter what type of map it is. So knowing that, you know, again, like housing, housing first is a huge part of reducing harm. Um, so if it's not going to be a map that's connected to housing, making sure that there is some kind of pathway to housing or a safe place to drink at least and a safe place to be at night. And then again, the importance of um, building programs that are really based on community connectedness and belonging, um, depending on what that means for that community. Um, this is a very great example of a type of program that I think like is really unique and really values the um, I think the foundation of community connectedness and belonging overall, right? Because Ambrose Place is an in, in Indigenous-led map um, in Edmonton. And so part of this program is really, I shouldn't say that it's even a map. So it's a housing site that is informed and grounded in Indigenous knowledge and culture-based healing that drives the design of the house itself, the services that are offered, the support, the supports that are there in which MAP is only one small part of that. And it's recognized as one way in which people are able to be safer, able to be not judge, able to develop trust and relationships so that they can engage in this type of um, community. I don't, how much time do we have? I'm gonna skip the cannabis piece just because we don't have a whole lot of time. So as I talked about, you know, we have the key dimensions of MAP, um, more than just MAP. MAP does the, um, at its basic, you know, disrupts the constant cycle of displacement, survival and disconnection. With this, people um, have to engage in less survival strategies and are able to um, focus on quality of life and harm reduction over time. Um, there's really a need for a variety of map models that are tailored to a spectrum of community needs. It's not a one size fits all approach. Um, this idea of a highly medicalized regulated map model is okay for some, but we'll talk about a little bit more um, during COVID about how that's kind of been shifted a little bit based on kind of the needs of the person. And um, with this, depending on the model of map that we have, that will really change um, the policies of um, the program itself, right? So program eligibility for um, like a medicalized program might look a lot different than for a drop-in peer-led program. And I'll hand it over to you again, Bernie. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to not talk too much because uh, Megan told me at the beginning I talked too much. So I'm gonna just highlight some of the outcomes over about eight years of research uh, from the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program study. Next slide. Um, this is from one of our pilot studies where one of the participants said, this program has given me hope and allowed me to really think what I wanna do with the rest of my life because I was stuck, not stuck. I guess you could say rock bottom, going home couldn't get me out of that rock bottom I was in. But since coming here, I know there's a horizon waiting for me. And I chose that quote because it really exemplifies what many participants had to say about the impact of the program in terms of a feeling of connectedness to the program, a feeling of home and hope. Next slide. Uh, some other outcomes are that uh, people in the map have been able to retain housing. Many people had been homeless prior for considerable period of time and also experienced increased feelings of safety. Um, they were, if you think back to that slide on acute, chronic and social harms, um, we actually uh, evaluated um, those harms and found that people reported fewer physical and social harms. So both the acute, particularly the acute harms. Um, and we'll talk a minute in about, about the chronic. Safer, they were drinking safer sources of alcohol with safer patterns of consumption. So less non-beverage. Um, one of the really, I think, cool findings is that while people were still drinking every day, they were actually overall drinking less. So that smoothed out the pattern of drinking with less binge drinking um, than they were on the street. Next slide. Uh, people reported improved quality of life. 
Um, in some cases, people talked about reconnection to uh, feeling part of a, a community um, on the site, but also in some cases reconnecting. And then we did some economic analysis with 43% reduction in police calls, 47% um, reduction in hospital admissions, and those translated in um, to economic savings, about a dollar twenty-one for every dollar dollar nine. Next slide. Um, we undertook uh, because of the concern around chronic harms. We did some longitudinal analysis, one where we looked at alcohol use and harms over twelve months for fifty-nine new map and one hundred and sixteen controls, six sites, five cities, and we also looked at mortality and healthcare utilization. And we were using hospital. Um, healthcare records for that. So we had a much bigger sample, 215 map and 131 controls. And we also did it over 10 years. So much uh, stronger analysis. Next slide. Um, what we found in the trajectories of alcohol and alcohol related harms at six and 12 months is both maps and controls reported fewer drinks per day, fewer drinking days, both reduced non-beverage, but MAP participants have fewer harms at baseline in six months. Uh, as I mentioned before, their drinking was spread out over more days, so smoother. Um, they had improved liver function at six months and their liver function deteriorated. So for MAP people, better um, they did better on the MAP than off the MAP because when they left the MAP, their liver status um, deteriorated. Um, this is still a fairly small study, so it's got some limitations. Um, and uh, we had pretty good follow up. And one of the things we noticed is uh, we looked specifically at policies. So, if programs had policies around um, limiting outside drinking, that seemed to have um, a better impact. But as we know from some of our other qualitative, it's probably more than just the drinking policies, it's what sense. Um, there's a degree of community, whether the supports are matched um, to people's needs also matter. Next slide. In terms of um, mortality, um, what we found, um, and I'm just going to, we did compare maps to the controls, but a lot of the findings were non-significant. Um, they were, they tended to be better for for MAP, which has clinical significance, but they didn't have statistical. So what I put on the slide here um, is uh, what happened with mortality for people when they were on the MAP versus off the MAP. So when people were in the MAP um, and attend being attended in the MAP, they had a 63% reduction in their mortality risk, so obviously um, significant, and they were 26% less likely uh, to go to the eMERGE um, department. And um, although there was some differences in what they went to eMERGE for. Next slide. Um, and then hospital bed days. Uh, people, now this is comparing the maps to the controls, the controls being people um, who met the criteria for map but weren't in map, is they actually had significantly fewer hospital bed days overall. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, it actually translated into um, seven fewer hospital bed days um, per year. So, and uh, there was no increased risk of death because something that we often get asked is, you know, are people dying in these programs? Um, there, there are definitely, whoops, can we just go back? Programs related to palliative care, um, but people are not dying because of, of being in the map. Um, for the MAP participants, there was a reduced risk of death when they were on the MAP and fewer EDs uh, visits that I just mentioned. So um, really seeing the role of MAP in, in harm reduction. Um, and then we're just working on a cost benefit analysis. So that's a quick flyover of um, the outcomes. And we do have quite a few papers. Um, this is um, a little uh, infographic, not infographic, more a bulletin that we produced during COVID to try to provide some evidence-based guidance about the scale up of managed alcohol programs. Next slide. And uh, we also uh, worked with the BCCSU to develop um, guidelines around COVID um, and the establishment for MAP because in the risk mitigation guidelines for BC, managed alcohol was mentioned as a strategy, 
but there was no real guidance. So we developed um, the guidance you see on the right. Next slide. Um, this is, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Megan here. Back to you, Megan, to finish. Yeah, so um, this has been, so this is part of the operational guideline. As Bernie was saying, we started receiving um, requests um, from um, the province and communities in BC at the beginning of COVID around, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, because they were seeing escalating um, alcohol related harms, um, particularly for people experiencing homelessness, but also for people um, who are housed in terms of access to alcohol supply, um, you know, people being laid off or people not being able to panhandle, people not being able to bin, meaning like when um, people might collect often like recyclables, um, all those types of things were being shut down. Um, liquor stores were reducing their hours and people were also getting COVID. So we were getting requests from communities about, you know, how do we support people? How do we mitigate harms that are happening because of impacts of COVID to the system? And then how do we support people with alcohol management who don't want to go through withdrawal management when they have COVID or when they're awaiting testing? And so we developed these guidelines and, um, you know, the health authorities wanted to see clinician-led or clinician-based models. So we developed one here on the right, or we had recommendations there, but there was also a big demand for, you know, how do we do this in a way for people that aren't necessarily meeting the traditional criteria for, you know, the more medicalized traditional map um, in terms of like, a diagnosis of severe alcohol use disorder or who are drinking, you know, 20 plus standard drinks per day. Um, how do we kind of support people across the spectrum of um, drinking? And so um, we, we recommended two separate models um, that could be taken up pretty easily in terms of outreach based map, one of them being a community led map um, that has a different type of leadership in terms of um, peer, peer and Outreach leadership potentially, um, you know, doesn't include um, clinical staff, um, and one that's more um, clinician-based for people that have potentially more um, needs in terms of um, acute and chronic health needs. So with with both models, you know, um, we saw them roll out in some some communities um, in which um, they were often team-based and um, it would involve, you know, on either end of the spectrum, you know, a nurse, an outreach worker, social worker, or a peer-led team with an outreach worker connected to, um, you know, a clinician if they kind of wanted some advice um, in terms of, you know, interactions of alcohol with meds or if someone's having a health issue. And um, we developed some protocols and documents for outreach-based MAP. And so this was taken up by a few different um, communities, as I said, and um, kind of the complement of those would look very different um, based on the um, type of people that you are supporting in terms of their alcohol harm and health, their, their alcohol harms and um, health needs. So I think I'm going to stop the recording for, for the discussion here. So I'll just say bye to everyone on the recording. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, no, I haven't stopped the recording. I just stopped the sharing. One second. <laughs>